Um, my name is Bim Oliver and I am a consultant in Salt Lake. Uh, I research and write about places and I work with Preservation Utah on a number of things, including research about the history of Federal Heights. And that's what we're going to talk about this evening. In fact, um, our agenda for this evening is this. We are going to walk through a brief history of Federal Heights and I should note that uh, the history is going to run up to about 1920. That's really the kind of key development period of this area of the city. Uh, at about 640 or so, we'll have time for questions and answers. And then following the question and answer session, we're hoping that those of you who live in Federal Heights will stick around for a little bit, for 10 minutes or so, and we'll talk about the historic homes tour that Preservation Utah is planning to conduct in Federal Heights this May. So that's our agenda for this evening. If you have questions, what I would ask you to do is put them in the chat and we can get to them at the end or you can hold them to the end. And when we get there, we can uh, have a conversation, if you will, uh, live. So we're gonna walk through a brief history of Federal Heights. And the first question we need to answer is, what actually is Federal Heights? Well, the reality is that the area that we know today as Federal Heights actually wasn't always that. In fact, for a number of years, for most of its existence, it was two separate areas. The area in blue, the lower area, is the original Federal Heights, and the area in green in the map, uh, outlined in the map here, the upper area, if you will, is another area completely, at least for a number of years it was, um, and it has a much more, to me, interesting and complex history than the original Federal Heights. But we're gonna talk about both of these areas in our history this evening. This is a plat map from Salt Lake City uh, from 1888. And I just wanna ask you, Liz, can you see my cursor here? No, can't I can't. See, can't see a cursor. Okay, well, uh, let's see, hold on a sec. Uh, okay, well, we'll make do without a cursor. There are a couple of things that I want you to note in this map. Uh, the first thing to, you can note without a cursor is that all the streets are laid out at right angles. They, they are, this is the typical uh, Utah grid, if you will, uh, perfectly rectilinear. The other thing that you might want to note is in the upper right of the map, the very upper right, you might be able to pick out Fort Douglas Reservation. And just below that is a large blank area that was not part of the city in 1888. Uh, and there really wasn't any residential activity uh, in this area at that time. That's not to say that there wasn't any activity at all. In fact, there was quite a bit of activity. Uh, there were a number of brickyards that were operating in this area. Salt Lake Iron, Lime and Rock operated a set of kilns in the very upper part of this area. And in fact, I believe the ruins of some of those kilns are still there. And there were a couple of prospectors who were searching for uh, coal and actually found a coal vein in the very upper part of, of this area. There were also slaughterhouses operating in this area. And the slaughterhouses in an indirect way were the namesake for a small settlement that evolved here called Butcherville. Uh, Butcherville was enough of a community that it actually fielded a baseball team called the Bloody Boys, a name that I assume refers to how they conducted themselves uh, at work rather than how they conducted themselves on the baseball diamond. There were also recreational activities. There was ski jumping on Douglas Hill, which again is the very upper part of this area. And in fact, if you live in what I'm calling the upper heights, the area that was outlined in green in that first map, you may see tracks left over from some of these ski jumping competitions on Douglas Hill. So this was an area that was full of activity but it was not a residential area per se. That is until 1906, when a couple of uh, partners in a realty firm, Telluride, Telluride Realty, Lucien Nunn and A.W. Wrench, who sounds like he just escaped from the Clue game, purchased property from LeGrand Young, Judge LeGrand Young, a total of about 40 acres. Now I'm referring here to what I call the Lower Heights. That's the area bounded in blue in that original map. Nunn and Wrench purchased this 40 acres from LeGrand Young for about $100,000, which equates in current dollars to about $3 million 
or about $75,000 an acre. Now, if you think of the value of your lot, regardless of where you live in Salt Lake, it's probably considerably less than an acre and it's worth considerably more than $75,000. So this was really, even in current dollars, even in current valuation, a, a real bargain for Nunn and Wrench. Young, by the way, had acquired this property from the federal government in exchange for rock quarrying rights at the mouth of Red Butte Canyon. And if you're familiar with Fort Douglas, you know that the oldest buildings on the fort were constructed out of Red Butte sandstone. Well, Nunn and Wright uh, submitted the following plat map to the city of Salt Lake. Uh, and the plat map is distinctly different from the one that we looked at earlier, in particular because its streets are not rectilinear. They are definitely curvilinear. They follow the topography of Federal Heights. So this was really kind of a very different layout, if you will, for Salt Lake City that was envisioned by the developers Nunn and Wrench. Well, not everybody was excited by this proposal. In fact, the University of Utah was distinctly unexcited by the proposal and in fact was described by the Deseret News at the time, this is about 1907, as strongly opposed. And the reason for the protest, the news wrote, is because a number of the houses in that addition, they're referring here to Federal Heights, will back against the north front of the university campus and the regents, basically the board for the university, fear that coal sheds and outhouses will be built on the lots and thereby mar the view from the university. Now the university specific concern was the alignment of 100 South. And I don't have my cursor operating now, but I want you to pay your attention to, or point your attention to the area bounded in blue here. If you look uh, in the left, kind of lower left corner, you'll see an oval that's the entry, one of the entries to Federal Heights. That was their proposed alignment for 100 South. It would jog north from its existing alignment and the lots that were at the very southern edge of Federal Heights, the ones that are closest to the lower edge of this map, would face north. Well, the university's concern was that they would face north so their backyards would face toward the campus. Now, you might think this is kind of a minor grievance, but it actually, it actually escalated in a, to a, a significantly contentious issue. So contentious that there was a meeting of the city council in September, 1907, with a number of very hot disputed uh, issues at play. And the interactions were to say the least, not cordial. For example, Thomas Black, who was a council member who was opposed to this layout, quote, declared that the Federal Heights people had taken occasion to roast him Every time they appeared before the committee, Mr. Lackner, who was the attorney for Federal Heights, replied that perhaps Black was too sensitive. A little later in the meeting, the following exchange occurred. In reply to Mrs. Kinney's statement, now Mrs. Kinney was a representative of the University of Utah. In reply to Mrs. Kinney's statement that it had been her effort and work to make the university campus a beautiful park Mr. Wrench stated that it certainly did not bear much resemblance to a park now, but that it looked more like a backyard. Well, you can imagine that tempers at this point were somewhat elevated. And in fact, at the end of the meeting, Councilman Black walked up to Mr. Wrench, and I imagine at this point he's poking his finger into Wrench's chest and he said, do you know, Wrench, that I think the attitude you assumed before the committee this evening was that of a D dash 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 D fool. You can fill in the blanks yourself. So what might seem to you or to me like a relatively simple issue turned into a highly contentious one and in fact was something of a barrier for development for Nunn and Wrench um, until it was resolved a couple of years later. Nevertheless, they did proceed with development. There are a couple of images of the development of Federal Heights in its very early stages. Um, you can see uh, on the right are a couple of ornamental, excuse me, ornamental gates that were constructed as part of the entry from South Temple Street. Uh, I drove through Federal Heights a couple of weeks ago to re-familiarize myself with the area. I didn't see these gates. If they're still there, maybe you can uh, place a note in the chat to let me know that I missed them somewhere. Uh, but I want to describe, I want to read you a description from the Salt Lake Telegram at the time that talks about how the development was proceeding. 
where sharp cut gullies and ravines cut the landscape, where the heavy draws lock as if they would stay forever, and sagebrush, grease, sagebrush, greasewood, and willows grow in wild profusion, unobstructed in their course. There is now a force of men and teams filling in the declivities, rolling and scraping and smoothing the ground, where there will soon be one of the grandest residence sections in the city. Now, the estimated cost of all this was about 2.5 million in current dollars. Again, imagine 2.5 million would do maybe what, a couple of acres nowadays, and they're actually preparing about 40 acres, a significant effort on their part. Well, the developers were also heavily promoting this area. And I should note as well as, well as the fact that the university was disputing the alignment of 100 South and disputing the layout of Federal Heights, um, the Heights themselves, this development was not yet annexed into the city. It was not part of the city. So if you were gonna buy property in Federal Heights, you were gonna buy property in an area that was not incorporated, meaning you probably wouldn't get water, you probably wouldn't get sewer, you probably wouldn't get police or fire services. So the development at this point is still what I would consider to be speculative. Nevertheless, the developers are promoting a way. Um, and they're taking advantage of every opportunity, including an automobile race that was sponsored by the Salt Lake Telegram in 1907 that ran up through Federal Heights. And now think about the fact that in 1907, there really weren't many automobiles around. And one of the elements of the auto that intrigued people the most was, can it go up a hill? Well, there are hills in Federal Heights. So we're gonna run the race through Federal Heights and the developers, Nunn and Wrench, were astute enough to say, hey, if you're coming to see the race, why not buy a lot while you're here? Now, I'm gonna read you from um, a description of Federal Heights that appeared in the Deseret News. This is the first of a series of uh, sets of florid pose, prose that I ran across as I read about the history of Federal Heights. And I will tell you that whoever the developer was, wherever the development was occurring, uh, the developers felt a need to be, to say the least, effusive about the qualities of their development. Federal Heights commands a beautiful view of Salt Lake City's finest scenery. To the west stretches the Salt Lake Valley, spreading for miles and miles to the north and south. Away to the right, the dome of Salt Air Pavilion glitters in the sunlight, even brighter than the miles of water reaching into the valleys beyond. The smelters at Garfield, Bingham, and other canyons and closer, the prominent points in the city itself are all in one panorama at the foot of the heights. To the east is the Wasatch Range, the foothills almost within a stone's throw of any home to be on the heights. The mountain air comes down from the canyons on all sides cool, but not cold. These are the beauties one notices first. Now, if that's not enough, A.W. Wrench himself declared that the new addition, Federal Heights, will be a veritable, quote, domain of Arnheim. And if you know what that reference is, you become valedictorian immediately because I didn't know what that reference was. It's actually a reference to a fictional landscape, an idealized landscape created by Edgar Allan Poe. So we're, one of the themes that you're gonna hear this evening is that regardless of when the development was occurring, was occurring, regardless of who the developer was, the descriptions of these areas were, to say the least, over the top. Well, one of the issues that was, to me, intriguing, and I hadn't really thought about it, I'd run into it in some research I'd done before about Salt Lake history, but one of the elements that the developers, both of the lower heights, the area in blue in that first map, and the upper heights, the area in green in the first map, one of the issues that they capitalized on was the fact that in the early 1900s, Salt Lake City had a really significant air quality problem. Um, and that air quality problem was due to a couple of factors. The first was that the smelters that were referred to somewhat ironically in that previous quote, um, were operating in the Southwest part of the valley in the central part of the valley. And they of course were producing a lot of pollution but even more to the point here, I think, was the fact that um, most of the homes in Salt Lake City at the time were heated with coal. So you had significant air pollution issues in Salt Lake City in the early 1900s. So if you're gonna live in Federal Heights, you're gonna live where, if you see in this ad on the left, the air is pure. And if the developers had the opportunity then or had the potential then, they probably would have put this in flashing fonts. 
Now, I, it's a little difficult to see in the image on the right, but if there's a distinct line of haze that runs across the valley in this image, and we're going to see uh, again later on uh, in the pr uh, promotion of the upper heights, this same issue coming to play. If you live up here in the heights, if you live up here above the smoke, you're going to live a happy, healthy life. Well, we talked about the fact that the University of Utah was, to say the least, unhappy with the original alignment proposed for 100 South. And in fact, uh, not long after this contentious meeting that we, uh, that we looked at earlier, the university filed suit against the developers. The suit was dismissed. The university and developers reached a happy agreement and the area here in blue in this map, uh, if you can make it out, you'll see that first south now runs to the south of those lower lots in Federal Heights, meaning that they are now going to face south. They're going to face towards the university. So this agreement, you know, I, I don't want to sort of be too uh, extreme in uh, commenting that I think the university's concerns and their dispute of the alignment, the original alignment of First South could have been a real stumbling block for the developers. But this resolution was a significant, uh, a significant milestone in the development, I think, of the lower heights. Nevertheless, even though we have uncertainty, we have the fact that it's still not annexed into the city, the Federal Heights is still not annexed into the city, and that uh, at least in 1908, when this home was constructed, the university is still disputing the alignment of 100 South, excuse me, there were some, um, there were some homeowners, some pioneers, we might even call them, who decided to build homes in Federal Heights. Uh, the first one belonged to a gentleman named Owen Gray, and this is his home. It's at 74 North Virginia Street, and it looks very much today like it did then. I don't know what the original colors were, but the house itself looks just great. If you are the owner of this home, you should be extremely proud. It's a really beautiful home. Nevertheless, Owen Gray is building a home in 1908 in Federal Heights, still not part of the city, so he's not guaranteed he's going to get water or sewer or police or fire protection. So he's maybe, we might even call him a little bit of a gambler. Well, one of the elements of both the lower heights and the upper heights that was significant in the development uh, of the area is the fact that the developers imposed significant restrictions on homeowners. Uh, we tend to think, I think, sometimes of ordinances as being a relatively uh, contemporary element of our lives. But the fact is the developers knew that the value of these developments was based in the quality of the developments and they wanted to ensure that quality. So for example, the lots in Federal Heights were going to be sold for no less than $4,000 uh, at that time. There were to be no double houses, stores or apartment houses constructed in Federal Heights. And in this ad, in the lower uh, section of this ad is the horrible potential that might occur or that might be realized if there weren't these restrictions. Um, on either side of this uh, perspective, if you will, are what would might be considered the um, the 7-Elevens of their day, you know, the grocery stores and the hardware stores. They're not gonna happen in your neighborhood because we're placing, we the developers are placing these restrictions on Federal Heights. And we're gonna see that theme coming back again in the upper heights as well. So, the lower heights didn't develop very quickly. This is a series of what are called Sanborn maps, and I'm not expecting you to pick out the detail in these maps. What I do want you to see, or what I hope that you'll see, is how the development proceeded, how quickly the lower and upper heights filled in. Now, this set of maps is for what I would call the lower, lower heights, which is the, the heights between um, South Temple to the north and 100 South to the south. And these maps were produced by a company called the Sanborn Company. They were maps that were used for insurance purposes, and Sanborn produced them between uh, the late 1800s and the mid 20th century. Uh, and you can see in these maps, the first one in the upper left is from 1911. You can see there really aren't any houses in the lower, lower heights at this point. Uh, probably too soon after the city finally annexed the heights in 1909, probably a little too early for that to really develop. But in the middle is a map from 1926, and you can see 
even at that early stage, the lower lower heights are pretty well filled in. And by 1950, the map in the lower right, you can see that the lower lower heights, again, the heights below uh, South Temple Street are pretty much built out. These maps are of what I would call the upper lower heights. That's South, South Temple North to about 200, uh, second, excuse me, second Avenue. And again, you can see in the upper left, that's 1911, not really much uh, color in there. Any color you see is a house of some kind. In the middle, um, you can see it's pretty well filled in. And in the lower map by 1950, um, the lower heights are pretty well filled in. So really the true development of this area didn't occur probably until somewhere in the 19 teens. And at that point, it really accelerated in through um, the 1950s. So that's the early history of the lower heights. Now we're gonna look at the upper heights. That's the area that was bounded in green in that original map that I showed you at the very beginning of the presentation. This area has a much different, much more complex history than does the lower heights or do the lower heights. We're gonna start with this curmudgeonly gentleman. His name is Charles Popper. Now Charles Popper was a rancher. He was a butcher. He operated a slaughterhouse in, federal, in, in the upper heights um, as well as a soap factory. Of course, those two are sometimes related. Charles Popper is more significant for our narrative because he settled the upper heights, what we know as the upper heights in 1864. His neighbor to the south was a small installation called Camp Douglas. And as Camp Douglas expanded into Fort Douglas, uh, it expanded and encroached on Charles Popper's property. Well, at that point, the fort, the War Department, ordered uh, Charles Popper to vacate his property. But Charles Popper had friends. In fact, he had one friend in particular who was significant, a congressman from Colorado, who introduced a bill into United States Congress that was passed in 1885, requiring the federal government to cede the land to Charles Popper. All told, that was about 150 acres. So if you live in the Upper Heights, you have Charles Popper and his curmudgeonliness to thank for, for your beautiful home. Well, this is a, an artist's rendering of Salt Lake City. It was not uncommon for real estate companies around the country at the time to hire artists to uh, provide a visual representation of what a community looked like. Uh, what's important for our purposes in this particular drawing is uh, the area circled in red in the upper right of this map. And you might be able to make out that it says Popperton Place. There's a reason for that. In 1888, Charles Popper sold the property to Colborne Skinner and Company, which was a local real estate firm. Again, we're talking about about 150 acres. Um, and Colborne Skinner and Company was actually not a development company. They were real estate agents. So they turned around and sold the property to the Denver Syndicate, which sounds like they just walked off the set of The Sopranos, but it was actually a development company located in Denver, Colorado. And what's really interesting about this to me anyway, is that the Denver Syndicate marketed Popperton Place, not to the residents of Salt Lake City, but to the residents of Denver. And here's how they described Popperton Place to the residents of Denver. The vast army of westward tending people is again on the march. It camped a while upon the banks of Cherry Creek, which runs through Denver, and build it here your stately city. But the restless spirit that has kept it moving for a century still impels it onward, and its mighty columns are already following the windings of the River Jordan to a camping place on the shining sands of the Great Salt Lake, the mysterious sea on the sunset slope. Over there, another Denver is springing into existence, and Salt Lake City will be to the rich basin region of America, the empire of Utah, what Denver is to the mountain country. The Almighty selected its site in the most beautiful and productive valley on the earth and placed about it on every side the boundless resources of the empire. He did more. He gave it a climate so perfect that under its benign influences, human ills find no lodgment there. Indulge no longer in vain regrets that you did not invest in Denver in time for the har harvest. Another equally great opportunity awaits you in the promised land. Buy now in Popperton Place, the most sightly residence portion of Salt Lake City, and you will be in time for the certain rise. And I'll say 
that's not the last uh, bit of florid prose that we're going to run into this evening. And it may not even be the floridist of the prose that we're going to run into this evening. So the Denver Syndicate is marketing property in place to residents of Denver. Um, but they're also talking to the residents of Salt Lake City. They're letting them know a little bit about how cool this area is, because who knows, maybe some of them might want to buy property here as well. One of the things I want you to note in this image here, which is an inset from that uh, artist rendering that we saw in the previous slide, is that the streets are laid out in straight lines and right angles. It looks like a grid. That's going to change significantly as this area becomes development, developed. Excuse me. But I want to come back to another theme that we've talked about in the marketing of both the lower and uprights, and that is your health. Here's an ad about um, Popperton Place from the 1890s. Naturally, naturally, the higher portions of any city are the most healthful. There is less soil impurity and better drainage. The conditions favoring the generation of disease germs do not obtain to so, to so great a degree as in the lower portions where groundwater arises, carrying its impurities and offering the moisture that is conducive to germ life. And here's a quote from a report that was issued by Health Commissioner Beatty, Salt Lake Health Commissioner Beatty in 1894. This is a quote from that report. In the ad, the next most significant fact to be noticed in the diagram is the entire absence of, all caps, typhoid fever in the higher portions of the city and its prevalence in the lower. Again, our theme of the evening is, if you live down there, you're gonna die. If you live up here, you're gonna live a happy, happy, healthy life. Well, one of the elements that's significant about any development is the ability of its residents to come and go as they want, to get where they want to. So Popperton Place benefited in 1892 from the construction of a new streetcar line that ran along Third Avenue and up into Popperton Place. Here's the extension of the streetcar line up into Popperton Place. So we have the developers, the Denver Syndicate. We have this incredible place to live, obviously, and we have now a way to get around. What's to stop us from moving forward? Well, there's a significant event in 1893 that's going to bring a halt to the Denver Syndicate's activities. And that is the Great Panic of 1893. Now, today we uh, use the term depression to describe a panic. The Great Panic of 1893 was in its own way probably as significant as the Great Depression of 1929. It, it absolutely tore the country apart. And in fact, um, the Salt Lake Herald Republican a number of years later would describe which, what it did to the uh, owners, the, the principals in the Denver Syndicate as follows. It, quote, reduced many of the wealthy stockholders of the Denver Syndicate to paupers and left paupered in place with an impotent ownership. In other words, they didn't have the dough to really move forward with development. Having said that, there were a few homes constructed in paupered in place. And to be perfectly frank, I'm not sure if any of those homes remain. Nevertheless, there was a little bit of development, but it was not certainly the concentrated intensive development that the Denver Syndicate had intended. So in 1908, Samuel Newhouse purchased Popperton Place from the Denver Syndicate. At that point, it was about 140 acres, probably because some of the property was in other private ownership. To purchase the property, he took out a $100,000 mortgage, and I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because it plays a significant role in the evolution of this area. The other thing that Samuel Newhouse did was he modestly renamed this area Newhouse Park. Well, Samuel Newhouse, if some of you may be, may be familiar with his story, he was a significant figure in Utah history, certainly at the turn of the 20th century. He made his uh, millions in mining, um, and he invested in a number of different things. He lived a, a lavish lifestyle. He was one of the contestants in that 1907 auto race up into Federal Heights. Uh, Samuel Newhouse had big ideas, and his big ideas for Newhouse Park included the following. He was going to have cascades and falls installed. He was going to install pretty little pagodas all over the place. He was going to build a magnificent clubhouse where at one time stood the historic old brick and rock home of Charles Popper. 
he was going to build a bridge spanning Dry Canyon, which is the canyon that runs down into the upper part of Federal Heights. He was going to have a sylvan dale or attractive breathing space created. He even thought about building a reservoir at the mouth of Dry Canyon. He had plans to build another a streetcar line as well as a grand boulevard extending from Newhouse Park all the way to what was then 12th South, which we now know as 21st South. And you can see here another artist's rendering of Newhouse Park, uh, this one of Newhouse Park. Again, we're not rectilinear anymore. We're following the topography of this area in the layout of the streets. Well, Newhouse was a, also an aggressive promoter. Um, he even offered up a new house in uh, Newhouse Park <laughs> um, as a grand prize in a local contest. And so here's a, an artist's depiction of that grand prize in the local contest. And he was probably even more effusive than um, the developers of Federal Heights or the Denver Syndicate in promoting his new development, Newhouse Park. Here's what Samuel Newhouse said about this new area. Where good people build homes and have pre-grounds, where the honeysuckle and the red rose clamber about the porches, where the houses do not jostle and crowd, <coughs> excuse me, where beautiful gates mark every entrance and the streets paved and dustless, arc fringed with spreading trees and grassy parks, where the air, fresh from the peaks, has never felt the polluting touch of smoke, you might underline that one, where neighborhood pride prevails, and where one standing on his doorstep can see the lights go on and off at Saltaire and every train for the city 15 miles away. Where, at, by the way, still one sentence. Where at evening he can see the imperial sun passing through the gateway of the west, discharging a quiver full of golden arrows, arrows that plunge into the clouds or glancing from the towers and steeples of the city, light with their luster, every window and roof, and fall in rose and purple showers upon the eastern peaks. Where all these things are, there is the ideal place to live. I guess so. Well, this is what Newhouse Park looked like in 1908, shortly before or after Samuel Newhouse purchased it. At this point, it was still essentially Popperton Place, um, and nothing really, of course, had happened. Again, there were a few homes built, but probably not even a handful. And this is what the development looked like at that point. Well, the real work on Newhouse Park didn't start for another seven years until 1915. And the fact this delay was, bla was blamed on the fact that um, the streets were curvilinear, that they had a winding nature. But I think the reality was that Samuel Newhouse, like his predecessors, the Denver Syndicate, was running into significant financial difficulties. In 1911, he offered Governor William Spry 20 acres in Newhouse Park as the site of the state capitol. And it was represented at that time as an act of generosity, and it may well have been, <clears throat> but I interpret it as an act of maybe something even like desperation, because by 1911, Samuel Newhouse was in deep financial trouble. And in fact, only two years later, his financial affairs were assumed, management of his financial affairs was assumed by a gentleman named E.F. Walker, who at that point announced his intention to sell Newhouse Park. Several years later, in 1918, Governor Simon Bamberger sued Samuel Newhouse to recover a loan that he had given Samuel Newhouse, remember the $100,000 mortgage, and to recover his own personal financial capital because he had backed Samuel Newhouse politically, if you will, in the development of Newhouse Park, as well as other developments that Newhouse had engaged in. So in some ways, as Yogi Berra would say, it's deja vu all over again. We are seeing uh, this development that is highly promoted, that is the most beautiful place on earth, uh, the most beautiful place in the universe, maybe even, and yet no development has really occurred, and certainly nothing of any significance at that point. So in 1917, the Upper Heights is sold to a group called Bonneville on the Hill. Bonneville on the Hill was made up of a syndicate composed of prominent Salt Lake capitalists and others. They purchased the property for $350,000. And in 
Now I have to acknowledge, I don't know what Newhouse purchased the property for. We, we didn't get any real exact figures. He took out that $100,000 mortgage, but that may have been only part of the actual purchase price. Nevertheless, they purchased the property for $350,000. Um, and what's interesting to me in this image is that that's the same artist's rendering that Newhouse was using for his layout for um, Newhouse Park. The developers of Bonneville on the Hill essentially adopted the same layout. And I want to note, by the way, that <clears throat> Newhouse had hired the Salt Lake architectural firm of Ware and Treganza. And those of you who are familiar with Salt Lake architectural history will know that is a significant name in Utah architectural history. Well, Ware and Treganza were the landscape architects for Newhouse Park, and they were the ones who uh, laid out this particular street configuration that was now adopted by Bonneville on the Hill. Well, again, um, this is a great place to live. The weather on, at Bonneville Hill is just fantastic, of course, but more to the point, we're going to come back to one of our other themes here. Bonneville on the Hill is promoted as follows. It is above and beyond the smoke. That ought to be interesting to the quote downtown folks who have breathed black carbons until their lungs are the color of a new saddle. Yikes. So uh, we're kind of well beyond now talking about how beautiful a place it is. And we're getting really right down to the crux of the matter, which is that if you live down there, you're going to die. If you live up here, you're going to live. Well, this is a series of images of Bonneville on the Hill, and I appreciate the fact that they may not be particularly easy to see, um, but it, they do represent the development of Bonneville on the Hill as it was in 1931. This is about, what, 14 years after Bonneville on the Hill, the development group purchased the property. And I should note, by the way, if you've ever done any research into the history of development in Salt Lake, you will run into the name Bonneville on the Hill because that group did other developments around the city, not just here in what we now call Federal Heights. But even by 1931, there was still relatively sparsely developed, as we see here in these Sanborn maps of the Upper Heights. Now, we don't have a Sanborn map for 1911, which is rather unfortunate. Um, but we have one from 1926 on the left. And again, all you're looking for is color in the map. There's not a lot of color in 1926. And actually by 1950, um, the upper heights is pretty well built out. I wanna to note too, for a number of years, for a very long time actually, um, Second Avenue that ran through Popperton in Place, Bonneville on the Hill was called Military Avenue. And um, Third Avenue was called Fort Douglas Avenue. Now, I don't know if those streets still bear those names somewhere. Um, as I drove through, I saw 2nd and 3rd Avenue, but uh, kind of an interesting historical tidbit, I guess, about the development. This is an aerial view of the whole thing. Um, and I don't have my cursor available, but if you look on this map, if you look on the left, uh, lower, kind of the lower left, you'll see that curved street. That is Arlington. Uh, street and it is one of the area one of the streets in the upper heights um, but you can see by this time this is my guess it's an undated photo but I'm guessing it's probably in the late 1930s because in the upper part of this image you can see Fort Douglas and to the west or to the right of Fort Douglas um, in the early 1940s there would be significant development as the fort ramped up for World War II so this is um, uh, probably from the late 1930s, but you can see by that time, all of the heights, uh, the lower and upper heights are fairly well built out. However, they're still not at this point considered one area, if you will, one neighborhood. That I believe happened in 1948 when the residents of several neighborhoods within what we now know as the Heights, Federal Heights itself, Bonneville on the Hill, Popperton Place, and there's a small area in the city that still retains that name, and Virginia Place, which is also in that area, petitioned the city to zone their neighborhoods uh, together collectively as a double A zone, meaning it's single family residential. And there was a, a specific and direct purpose for that petition, and that was to keep out the enemy. And the enemy was 
the fraternities. We want to keep the fraternities out of Federal Heights. So we're going to keep this a single family dwelling neighborhood. And the petition was approved by the city. So at that point, those four areas were combined into one zoning district that was known as Federal Heights. And I believe that is the year or the sort of general time frame, late 1940s, when the lower heights and the upper heights, as we know it today, became one. However, there's still a part of the heights we haven't talked about, and that's the upper, upper, upper heights. Um, up at the very top of, of this area was a small chunk that still had not been developed. So in 1972, Prudential Federal Savings and Loan purchased 63 acres in the Federal Heights area, including the very upper, upper part of Federal Heights, but had no real plans to develop it. Develop it. So if you live on Federal Heights uh, Drive, for example, it's likely that your home was built in the late mid to late 70s, perhaps even later. There are a couple of little side streets up in that area as well. But Prudential Federal Savings and Loan uh, decided to call this area Federal Heights Crest. So we have now all of the areas of Federal Heights that by the late 70s certainly have been developed or are certainly moving on their way to being becoming full livable neighborhoods, if you will. So that's all I have for now. 